All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now a little after the top of the hour, 2 o'clock, and it is time for our next seminar today. This is put on by Chris Brook. Let me introduce him. And Chris Brook, he's a biologist with the Missouri Department of Conservation. And Chris, I'll let you uh, run through all your credentials, and um, you wear the badge, so I'll let you hand it over to you. So here we go. All right. Thanks, Clay. Thanks for having us out, and thanks for putting on the, the great extra. Oh. So I am the fisheries management biologist for the conservation department for Truman Lake. It is my responsibility to look at the regulations, look at the fishery, understand what I can about the fishery, and try to incorporate angler opinions into giving us the best regulations we can to make the best fishery we can for you guys. So a little bit about me. So I kind of tried to throw a brief history of parts of my life up here. The first picture is, is, is my mom at State Park Marina at Truman Lake in 1985, which was before I was even born, which is, is just kind of to say Truman and this fishery has always been a part of my life, my entire life, before I was even born. My parents were coming down here. So for me and, and the importance of fishing and being a fisheries management biologist, for me to loop back to what's kind of my home lake and be the fisheries management biologist, is, is a dream job for me and I I am in, invigorated every day with 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 the passion of being able to learn everything I can about this lake and understand it as well as I can and as you can kind of see all those so the pictures on the top three of those are from Truman or around Truman the ones below the dam and ones that our houseboat that we've had on the lake for years and years and years and then uh, the bottom is kind of some of my work experience. I worked with catfish for the conservation department for a while. I was a fishing guide up in Alaska for a while, and I worked at a Dutch Harbor. One of those are Dutch Harbor pictures on the right. So I, I kind of went away from home. I got some varied experience. I saw some other fisheries in some different parts of the world that are a lot different than this. And then I kind of looped back here and came home. I spent some time in Tennessee, too, where I got my master's degree. So. First thing I'm going to talk about is the Truman Lake brush piles. We put brush piles in. We try to do it every spring, winter. Uh, I normally do that in March. And I wanted to cover this because I get a lot of questions from people about how to find out where the brush piles are. And also to kind of show you what the process is. So this is a, one of the brush of the trees that we put in as a brush pile. As you can see, you know, a lot of people ask me, do we have any use for your Christmas trees? Well, it's easier for us to cut down a giant cedar tree and sink it in and have some, some big habitat there and some big limbs and a lot of stuff going on. That one is probably 10 or 12 feet to the top, and you can see that's all one tree with the main trunk on the bottom, and everything you're seeing is going to stick up and do fish habitat. So this is kind of the process. You can see how we do it. We get the tree ready, we tie center blocks on it, and then we use a tractor to load it onto the barge. This is our habitat barge you can barely see on the bottom left side there. And that's what it looks like loading it up. So we load it up, and it's got hydraulics, so we dump it off, and then it falls into the lake. We mark a point, put that on a map, and, and let you guys know where it is. We've been doing this for about 10 or 15 years, and we've got about 350 brush piles that we've placed across the lake. And what I'm calling a brush pile, it kind of depends. Sometimes if we have a really big tree, we might just put one of those giant trees there. We may have stacked quite a few, and it kind of depends on the year and who's, who's running the barge and how they want to do it. But 350 places that we've dumped trees. So, I just lost my, okay. I'm losing my connection or something here. Well, I'm losing my PowerPoint, so I'm not sure how this is gonna work. I'll just have to explain it to you, but. <clears throat> You can you, there's there's four four different ways that you can look at our brush piles that you can go through our website to, to see that and I think if it doesn't gets better I'm just gonna turn that off but um, so the first way is you go to mdc.mo.gov and you can click on fish 
and fishing and go where to fish. And the first option is we have PDF maps that have been made and there's a, a, a picture of an area of the lake and where we place brush piles and there's little points on the map. And at the end of this PDF, PDF file, there's coordinates where you can enter those into your depth finder. Some people like to enter those in manually by hand and see, uh, to just use it that way. They don't like the electronics and everything else. And then another option is our GPX files. So you can download those GPX files off of our website. And depending on your depth finder, you can put that GPX file file on your depth finder and it'll show up as waypoints on your on your unit. Each each unit's a little different. Uh, Hummingbird has a different system than, than Garmin and Garmin may be a little different for Lowrance. So exactly how you have to take that and put it on your depth finder is dependent on what brand and what exact model you have. So then we also have the Mo Fishing app. If you get the Mo Fishing app on your phone, and download it, you do a water body search, search for Truman Lake, and on the top right corner of that app, there's a little compass thing. If you click on that, it takes you to the map, and you can zoom in on where the brush piles are. And if you're out on the lake at the time, there'll be a little blue dot shows up on the map that tells you where you're at, and you can see where you're at in relationship to where those brush piles are. And then the, the other way, the fourth way, well, there's actually five ways. The fourth way, you can go to our interactive fishing map online, and that pulls up, pulls up through your web browser. You can zoom in on that. If you click on a point, it'll tell you the, the location, the GPS location of that. And the, the fifth way that I didn't put in here is you email me and you ask me for the latest coordinates, and I can get them to you. <laughs> So the latest ones, so this is the interactive map that you can go through the browser, and it's updated as soon as I send it in and they put it on, they'll update that. And we're, we're actually, we're, we're talking about going to a new system that would allow me to update that map, but we're not quite there yet. I have to send it in to our folks in Jeff City. And then the, the app, the fishing app updates almost immediately after we do it, and the... GPX file updates quickly after we do it. It's the PDF map that looks like this that you can download that they're a little bit slower. They don't always get them updated quite as fast, but everything else is updated immediately. So like, I mean, you put a, you put a tree in, I mean, fish will show up on it. They did studies where they, they did this as a project down in uh, uh, Table Rock Lake and they put trees in and came back and scuba dived them the next week and there were fish on those trees. Now, over time, there may be kind of a sweet spot there in time where they use it the best when it's still in good shape before it breaks down. So I don't know, it may not be at its best the next week and actually a lot of them, they still have those pine needles on them which can cause an issue. Um, it's harder to see fish on them if you're using your electronics and stuff. But, but the fish will move on to them pretty quickly after we place them in. So a project that we have going and one thing we're aware of is is when we place these fish attractors or the brush piles in the lake, those trees will break down over time. Some of them, depending on how well they're, they're weighted and how much current they may be catching in certain spots on the lake, they can get moved a little bit. So a project that we're looking at doing, hopefully get a lot of it done this summer, is going out with side scan and down imaging te technology and looking at those brush piles, looking at those trees and making sure they're still in place where they're supposed to be. And when we do that, my hope would be we work through those and we've got about 350 on the list that we'll try to work through. Hopefully we can get through them this year. And once we get done with that, we'll have a better idea and we'll update our maps to reflect ones that have been gone. If they're gone and washed away, we'll take them off the map and I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like in the end. It's the end product. We may have a little. We, have, we may have some categories of how good a shape they are. We may have an excellent, uh, a mediocre, and don't even waste your time because it's gone now category, um, <clears throat> depending on how that goes and how that looks. So, 
Now I'll, I'll get a little bit more into the biology and what I do is a job for my job for, for the main part of managing the fishery. And, and I get a lot of questions from people and well, a lot of people think that I write tickets. I don't write tickets. That's not my job. That's somebody else's problem. I manage the fish. I look at the fishery. And, and really, just a real quick fisheries biology 101, the things that really matter to me that help me understand what I know about the fishery is recruitment, how many fish are getting spawned, how many fish are getting stocked, how many fish are coming into that fishery. And, and recruitment, when we use it in a fisheries management context, it can mean how many fish are just simply being stocked, or we can also talk it how many fish are actually making it to legal length limit, how many fish are actually getting out there where you guys can catch them. So that's kind of the, the first dynamic function of, of a fishery is what's coming in. And then we can look at the growth rates. So look at the growth rates and see how fast the fish are growing. And we look at typically look at otoliths, that's uh, an ear bone in their head, and I can show a little more about that. If it's on the screen, we'll see what happens. And then the, the other thing that I need to look at and what matters for me as a fishery is, is the mortalities. And fish are going to die naturally over time. They may get ate by other fish. They may just die. And then they also, they get caught by anglers and they get harvested. So when, when we really boil down the fishery to its basics, how many fish are coming in, how fast are they growing, and how fast are they getting harvested or, or dying or leaving the fishery. So those are kind of the, the three big things that I look at as a fisheries management biologist. And, and I know I have a lot of conversations with people about fish moving, and that has some implications, but from a management implication standpoint, those are the three big things I'm looking at. So <clears throat> I'm going to start going through the fisheries kind of one by one and try to hit the major ones. I have the regulations up here. If anybody's curious what the regulations are, paddlefish, we obviously have our paddlefish season, March 15th to April 30th. Two fish, 34 inches, eye to fork. We had some regulation changes statewide on the paddlefish, but none of those regulations affected what you can do at Truman. So for, for this next snagging season, all the rules are going to be the same as they were last year on Truman, the Lake of the Ozarks, and Table Rock. We did up the minimum length on the statewide from 24 to 32, but that does not affect trimming. So we stock paddlefish annually to supplement the population. There is spawning and reproduction in Truman that we get. Um, we're, we're probably going to be doing some studies and try to get a better handle on that. We know some information have a general idea how much natural recruitment there is. But that's something that we're still working on, and we do still stock fish every year to get those fish into the fishery. And that information up there is, is how many fish we've stocked every year going back to 2003. We did downsize our fish a little bit for a couple different reasons. We had some renovations in the hatchery, and they couldn't hold them as long. So we are stocked, we stocked fish in June the last couple years where we normally stock the fish in the fall. And, and that's a project where we're looking at reevaluating when we stock them and how well they survive based on what time of the year we stock them and how long they are. So we do have some, some ongoing paddlefish work. We, we're actually getting ready. We have a statewide paddlefish management plan that we're getting ready to update that will kind of prioritize what work we have ahead of us and what we have going forward on a statewide basis. And we're, we're kind of at the beginning of the process of that, but I do think there's a lot of good paddlefish work ahead of us. There's a lot of interesting stuff that I'm excited to see how it turns out and what we learn. Um, one thing I do hear a lot of, and it kind of gets away from Truman and in the Lake of the Ozarks, but there's a lot of people that have issues with the dipsy divers and the number of fish being harvested out of the Lake of the Ozarks and to a lesser extent Truman. So I'll try to hit on this real briefly. What, what I think is going on with this, this system is Truman's population is about, I, I think we had that in 150 to 200,000 population, a pretty wide air bars there because it's hard to get a good handle on exactly how many fish up there are out there. <clears throat> but 150, 200,000 fish in Truman Lake paddlefish. And Lake of the Ozarks population is about half that much. 
And every year when we get high water, and, and we had a hundred fish tagged in Truman Lake for a five-year study, when fish disappeared out of the fishery, we tried to replace those to keep a steady hundred fish every year tag going in the, in the paddlefish season. And over our five-year study, we had 37 fish leave Truman Lake and go to Lake of the Ozarks, which is about a third, if not more than a third of our fish over a five-year period are ending up in Lake of the Ozarks. So Truman's population is about twice as much as Lake of the Ozarks, and I think we're probably losing about 6% of our fish every year out of Truman into Lake of the Ozarks, so that's highly variable with water flow. We lose more fish in wet years than we do in dry years. Um, so from a snagging standpoint, and all those fish, I think we, we, from our estimates, on a lot of the years, there's as many fish come out of Truman and go into Lake of the Ozarks than what get harvested in Lake of the Ozarks in a year. And that varies a little bit. It varies a lot from year to year. Harvest to vary, and the immigration, the fish that's moving out of the Truman varies. But when a lot of people talk about how many fish are getting harvested out of Lake of the Ozarks, I, I feel like these fisheries and the way they kind of interact with each other, I feel like Lake of the Ozarks is in pretty good shape. And it's also a put-and-take fishery where fish have to be 34 inches before they can be harvested. So when a fish has to be that large before it can be harvested, it's harder to overfish it, and there's always some, some smaller fish. And a 30-inch paddlefish isn't necessarily a small fish, but there's always some fish coming up to replace those in the fishery. So white bass and, and hybrid striped bass is a popular fishery on Truman Lake. It's also a popular fishery for people to complain about when they're crappie fishing and they don't want to catch white bass, but we're, we're not going to get rid of them, so you're just going to have to deal with that. So our regulation is 15 fish and no more than 4 over 18 inches. We don't separate out white bass from hybrid striped bass, and the regulation, they're all the same. It's just a matter how long they are. So we, we stock hybrids. Uh, we try to stock them every year, but we don't necessarily, it's, it's all dependent on hatchery production. We had some really good stockings, especially in 2019. And that 2019 class is really starting to come on strong, and I'll touch back that on a second. Um, but yeah, this is a fishery, especially the, hawk, uh, the hatchery, the, the, the hybrid fishery is a fishery that's made possible because of our hatchery and their stockings. So here's a picture of the white bass and the hybrid striped bass. Um, so these fish, that that white bass on top is probably 13 to 14 inches, and that hybrid on the bottom is about 15 to 16 inches. And the white bass on the top is probably a three to four year old fish, and that hybrid on the bottom is a two year old fish. And I know that just based on how that size class worked out and the number, the way the fish are in the population. So. You, you're all, however you want to, well, if you want to keep a fish, you can keep a fish, but I get a lot of people asking questions, you know, like, what should I keep or what shouldn't I keep? And ultimately, that's your own decision. But I can tell you that the hybrid on the bottom here has a lot more potential to grow into a 10 or 12 pound hybrid eventually. So, and it's a younger fish than this, this fish on top that's a little bit smaller. So if you're, if you're looking to help the hybrid fishery out, and that's something that you're interested in, then I'd recommend throwing back these smaller hybrids and, and, and keeping your white bass, because that white bass on top doesn't have near the potential. If you just want to go out and catch some small hybrids and eat them, then you can do that too. But either way, that's what, kind of from a biology standpoint, what I want to do is help you guys understand what your decisions, if you want to catch or release a fish, or what you want to do biologically, I want to help you guys understand how that affects the population. So I have been aging hybrids for the last four years, and this is kind of the growth curve and the trajectory of how they grow, and all the different fish I've, I've aged over the years. So they'll go from, you know, two-year-old fish is about 17 inches, and then they'll jump up to about 19 to 21 to 23, and then they kind of start leveling off and slowing down a little bit. We do have way out on the far end, the oldest hybrid I've aged was 16 years old. That's a pretty old hybrid. Um, I've, I've seen some studies. I know there's a study up in Nebraska. I think they had some fish that were 17 
So it's not like the oldest hybrid ever known, but it's it's getting pretty close. And, and it's interesting, I find it interesting to, to see those fish and see how old they grow. That fish was just a little bit over 24 inches. So the largest fish in our fishery aren't necessarily the oldest fish in our fishery. And the oldest fish aren't necessarily the largest fish. We do have about four pretty good classes of hybrids that are going to be in the system this year. Uh, and I highlighted where they will be, so they're not going to necessarily show up as a lot of dart, uh, dots. I'm showing out where they'll be this year. We have a really good three-year-old class, and those are fish that should be in that range from 18 to 22 inches. So we should be seeing a lot of 18 to 22 inch hybrids this year. And then we have a good class out there at uh, what five and six years old, which is 21 to 26 inches, which is kind of the heart of that fishery. And, and we have a couple good classes in there that should provide some good fishing. And then way on out there, I think we wanted to be the 7, 8, 9, 10. We have an 11 year old class that has been a pretty good fishery, a pretty good part of the fishery. It's been producing a lot of fish. By the time we get to 11 years, I'm expecting it to start tailing off. But at the same time, I've seen enough 10 plus year old fish that I think there's still going to be a few of those out there this year. And it's it, it's it's been a big class, but it's kind of kind of winding down to the end of the lifespan for those fish. So everybody likes to talk about walleye, it seems like. You know, there's... Um, so this is a fish that my sister caught this year on the weir when they were running water. And, and uh, it's always nice when you're out fishing for something else to get that unexpected surprise. When you get that fish up next to the boat and you see a little bronze sparkle, it's, I, I, it, I th it makes me excited. I think it mo makes most of us a little bit excited when we see that. So for walleye, there's a four fish daily limit and a 15 inch minimum length limit. So we, we stock walleye every year, and when we stock them, and actually you can't see the photo, but when we stock them, they're about that long, an inch and a half. So they're little bitty guys when we stock them. We try to put about 150,000 fish, and, and the way our hatcheries work, our hatchery system, we have what we call production fish, which is what we kind of expect the hatchery to produce. And we have surplus fish, which is what the hatchery produces if they exceed their expectations and they do have a good year. So we have production walleye that we stock every other year, and we have surplus walleye that we stock every other year. So we hope to get some every other year, and then if the hatchery does good, we can get it every year. So we stock, try to stock 150,000 walleye in every year. And I've been aging a few walleye that I've got from anglers and right now I, I aged 35 walleye in 2021 this past summer and 29 of those fish were from the 2019 class. We did not stock that class that year. Those are fish that appear to be naturally reproduced in that high water year and I think we have a class of walleye coming in from that three year old class now that's probably going to be the best walleye class we've seen in the lake for a long time. For at least 15 years, if, if, if not the whole history of the lake, it might be the best class we've ever seen. And then we also, in 2020, we stocked about 360,000 walleye. And as I said, we try to stock about 150,000 a year. 360,000 is a lot of walleye in the lake, or at least relative to what we normally do. And then we had another good stocking class where we hit our, our expectations in 2021. So we've got three pretty good classes of walleye coming through. Those three-year-old fish are in the range of 16 to 18 inches right now. And I'd expect those fish to, by the end of the summer, start going up and hitting 20 inches. A 20-inch walleye starts to look like a pretty good fish. So I'm expecting an uptick in the walleye fishing for the next few years because of these good classes that we have coming through. Um, I've been telling people and I told people today, if you're thinking about getting in and trying walleye fishing on Truman, try it the next couple years. If you can't figure it out, it's probably not worth it. Um, 
because this is the time. This is the time to be out fishing for them. So, oh, and there's my Asian growth. So that's where I said uh, 30, 29 of the 35 fish were from that three-year-old class that I, I aged this past year. And like I said, most of that from that three-year-old class, that's all natural recruitment. And then I showed you that picture where my sister caught that fish. That fish was nine years old and was a little over 26 inches. So that gives you an idea how long it takes those fish. And, and we had another one that was 26 inches that I aged. It was six or seven, looks like seven years old. So yeah, how long does it take to produce a 26 inch walleye? It looks like it's probably gonna take six to eight years, nine years on Truman Lake, and it varies a lot from fish to fish. So, so on to black bass. We have a six fish daily limit. A 15 inch minimum lean limit on largemouth, 12 inch on spotted bass, technically 15 inch on smallmouth bass, but you're getting pretty lucky if you see a smallmouth bass in Truman. I, I think we may get one or two every once in a while wander out of Palm de Terre in Stockton, but uh, if you found one on Truman, he's lost. So uh, I have a lot of bass anglers talk about how the bass fishing has declined in Truman over the years. Um, which is pretty typical for a reservoir to have a boom and have a few good years for 8 to 10 years, maybe 15 years. You have some really good years right when you build a reservoir because there's a lot of nutrients in that system. And as soon as you flood everything, they boom. And then there's typically a decline. And that decline has been a little, little more in, in Truman than what you see in a lot of your reservoirs. And I think there's there's a few issues that, that the largemouth bass fight, and I think a lot of that is your water levels, that up and down, we're a flood control reservoir, and we do a lot of protecting the lake, the Ozarks, and that up and down is not good for the bass population. Some of the other populations of fish have obviously been able to handle it quite well. The bass haven't been able to handle it quite as well. And we end up having some good years if you you get the conditions right and we flood some vegetation and by vegetation anything that's growing up on the bank that's normally terrestrial that's normally out on the land the fish can use that when it's flooded we get some good years when it floods that and things do really well but we don't have you know what really supports most good bass fisheries is a good bluegill population and i know i hear people talk about the shad well we got shad we got plenty of food but the timing of when bluegill spawn and the timing of when shad spawn is different. And that late, the bluegill spawn later into the summer, and your good reservoirs will spawn later into the summer than what, what shad will. And that allows those largemouth bass to feed on them longer. So I think that's one of our issues on Truman Lake. And <clears throat> I, I think it's an uphill battle to get to improve the bass fishery on Truman Lake. I did stick up there on the top right, that's a graph of what their catch rates are on Table Rock Lake compared to Truman. And the, their electric fishing catch rates on Table Rock bounce around 150 fish an hour. What we get on Truman at its very best was around 100 fish an hour, and it's kind of declined over the years, and we probably stick closer to 75. So when you start comparing what we're able to catch in our samples in Truman compared to some of the other reservoirs around the state, we just don't have the catch rates. And we've also seen over time, you know, the, the spotted bass population back in the 1990s, at least in our samples, was, was almost absent. And that has slowly kind of climbed over the years, although it's dipped off in the last four or five years, but it peaked about 2016, where in that sample we actually caught more spotted bass than what we did largemouth bass. So those fisheries may be kind of competing against each other, and the spotted bass seem to be doing, <clears throat> or at least increasing at a greater rate than what the largemouth bass are. Here is a look at our catch rates and it looks like it's kind of off the screen there but I can tell you that our catch rates in our bass sample last year peaked at about 14 inches that highest bar is 14 inch fish 
And then on the very far side, the largest fish we caught on our sample electrofishing last year was about 20 inches. Um, so that 20 inch fish is starting to get into that probably four to five pound range. It's a nice fish, but it's certainly not what you'd like to see is the biggest fish we caught in our electrofishing sample. And then those orange bars are the spotted bass population, which peaked at about 12 inches. Spotted bass don't grow as fast as largemouth bass. They don't get as big. And that's why we have a 12 inch minimum length limit on them. So this is a graph of the largemouth versus the spotted bass population. The orange is what percent is the spotted bass. And as you can see, the percent of spotted bass has steadily increased until like the last three years, three or four years. But the, the spotted bass has kind of increased in the largemouth bass have decreased over the years. So we'll talk about crappie for a little bit. They have a 15 fish daily limit with a 9 inch minimum length limit. And we, we sample crappie with trap nets. So you can see the trap net on the right is kind of spread out obviously on the road behind the shop. But that shows you what that setup looks like and when we pull them out in the water, they'll flare out like that, and the fish will swim into them. And we'll catch, on our very best nets, we may catch up to 150 or 200 crappie in a single net, uh, especially if you move up on the Tebow arms where we've really seen a lot of them. And uh, I know that sounds like a lot of crappie. Sometimes I get tired because they're all like six or seven inches uh, at, at times. So, And this is, on the left, that's us actually running a trap net. So we'll bring the net in the boat and then kind of dump all the fish down to the bottom. We untie a knot, dump them in a bucket, and we measure them and get them out of the boat as fast as we can. So <clears throat> this is where I've trap netted. If you, so I have sites all over the lake from one end to another, from Sparrowfoot to the dam, up to Windsor Crossing, down to Fairfield, up to Berry Bend, and all the way up to Wablo Creek. We've ran... This, this past year, we ran 240 net nights, which means at most of these sites, I put 10 nets in the water and I ran them for two nights. And we caught somewhere around 10,000 crappie in our nets in, in the fall in about three weeks of sampling, which is a lot of measuring of fish. So the, the graph here, the, the blue bars are the black crappie and the, and the white crappie are in the orange bars. You can see there's a peak on the whites around five to seven inches. That's what we're seeing. And, and I cut off the small fish because there's so many young year fish in there that they just messed the graph up. So I cut off the less than year old fish. But those, the white crappie has a really good class of fish in there from five to seven inches, which means we got fairly good reproduction. We got a good spawn off in 2020. We also have that peak up there from eight and a half to, and it kind of goes that clear out to 11 inches. Those age classes start to blend together, but we also have a pretty good class of fish from 2019 in the system. Those blue bars are pretty much all from one year class. It's all the 2019 year class, and I'll kind of parse those out a little more here in just a second. But the black crappie, the you know, and there's, they get a little spawn off from every year class, but the main, the main, most of the fish in, in the lake right now, the black crappie are, are those 2019 fish. And this is a graph that shows, so the, the white is the white, or the orange is the white crappie and the blue is the black crappie. How the percentage of white versus black crappie changes as you go across the lake. So we have the, the most our highest percentage of black crappie was in the lower lake area in the first three miles up the different arms from the dam. And then we had, what, 45% black crappie at Windsor Crossing and 40% at Fairfield. So those, those three areas, the Tebow arm, the Palmy arm, and the lower lake hang around 40 to 50% black crappie was still the majority normally being white crappie, but it's a pretty close cutoff. As you move up the lake, and I see they're cut off a little bit on the far right side, the, the last two are Barry Bend and Wablo Creek, where at Wablo Creek we had almost 95% or over 95% white crappie. 
So when you start talking about the lake and the crappie populations, there's a lot of different things that change as you move around the lake. And one of those is how many black versus white crappie are out there. And as you move up the lake, you generally get more white crappie. So this is our black crappie catch rates at the three sites where we had the most black crappie, which was Fairfield, Lower Lake, and Windsor Crossing. All these peaks are from the 2019 class where we have these three-year-old fish and ideally after a fish has been through three growing seasons we would like to be for that fish to be close to the minimum length limit which obviously on Truman is nine inches. At, at the Tebow arm those three-year-old fish from 2019 because they're so hump numbers are so high they're averaging about seven inches, maybe 7.1 inches. And you know, I talk about, I talk to people that have been fishing up in the Tebow arm, and it's like these fish are so small, they're not even catching the majority. They're talking about how small a fish they're catching, and they're not even catching the small ones. They're catching eight inches. So we really have, we do have some growth issues on the Tebow arm. And the, these fish, some of these fish might not ever reach our nine inch minimum length limit. So when we start talking to people, about well, why can't we go to a 10 inch minimum length limit? Well, a 10 inch minimum length limit would have good effects on parts of the lake and it would have issues on other parts of the lake. And if you look at the black crappie up at Windsor Crossing on the Tebow arm, we don't have the growth rates we need to go to a 10 inch minimum length limit, which is something that all has to be weighed out in that discussion, but it's definitely a problem for trying to increase the minimum length limit. Now, if we move down to the lower lake, Around the dam, those fish were averaging about eight and a half inches long. It's not quite as fast as what we'd like to see them growing, but it's a number that we can deal with, and those fish, hopefully, we'll start seeing more and more fish this summer, especially from that 2019 class on the lower lake, start moving up over nine inches and getting the fish that you guys can keep. Um, and then up the Fairfield, those fish are doing really good up in Fairfield. They're, they're averaging over nine inches already which is, is fairly decent growth for a good class of black crappie like that. And in general, and I'm talking about black crappie here, but in general, the white crappie will grow faster than the black crappie. And then you get a few fish that are hybridized, you get a few that the, the whites cross up with the blacks, and you get a hybrid crappie, and those grow the fastest of all the fish you see. The, the, the biggest fish on the lake are hybrid crappie, the biggest crappie on the lake anyway. So this is some age and growth, everything I've had for the last four years that kind of shows how fast the crappie are growing, but also how much variation there is. And I can, I can put that into kind of a length curve to put the averages on there. So this bottom bar is the black crappie, and it's taken them three to four years to get to nine inches whereas the white crappie are doing it quite a bit faster. They're, they're, some of those are getting there in, in less than three years. And then we have a few of those hybrid crappies. There's a very, I, I would, if I had to make a guess, I'd say one in every thousand fish in our net is a hybrid crappie, so there's not very many of them out there. Maybe we saw 10,000 fish, maybe we saw 10 of them this year. But they are the fastest growing fish in the lake. We age fish using they're odorless. There's an ear bone. If you follow the gills back to where they meet the top of the head, there's kind of a little capsule up there and you can pull the odorless out. And that's how we can age crappie. They put down rings. This is actually the odorless off of a hybrid crappie I aged a few weeks ago that was 17 inches long. And I think they weighed it in at Everhart's at like 2.74 pounds or something like that. And that was a six-year-old fish. Which may sound like that's a few years, but that's getting to that that's a really 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 fast growth to get a fish to 17 inches in six years is, is a spectacular growth and that's what it takes to get a really big fish so i have here a black crappie on top and a hybrid crappie in the middle and a white crappie on the bottom which you can kind of, so you can kind of see the difference there this particular hybrid has pretty good bars, but it has a deep body of the, the black crappie. Some of those, their, their bars will speckle up a little bit and they'll look more like a black crappie. I aged these fish 
They're all about the same length, between 13.2 inches and 14.1 inches. The white crappie was 14.1 inches and it was five and a half years old. The hybrid crappie was 13.2 inches and it was two and a half years old. And the black crappie was 13.5 inches and it was nine and a half years old. So I, I have people ask me from time to time, how big is this crappie I caught? So you caught one that was 13 some inches, it's probably somewhere between two and a half and nine and a half years old. <laughs> so uh, these, these two fish, that 13 inch, two and a half year old fish is one of the fastest growing fish I've aged. And that nine and a half year old fish is one of the oldest fish I've aged. So those are definitely the outliers, but at the same time it does show how much variation there is between fish to fish and how much difference there can be. And I kind of show this here on the bar, where a 13 inch fish, you hit that 13 inch line, it goes through a dot that's three years old, and it goes through a dot that's 10 years old, which kind of shows you the difference there can be from fish to fish. And even within the same age classes and the same species, you can see a lot of variation. So you ask, like, if, you, if you're curious, how old is a two-year-old fish, a fish after two growing seasons? And we're looking somewhere between at the very slowest, four and a half inches, to at the very fastest, some of those fish may be up 10, 11. I had one up close to 12 inches, which is just ridiculous. Um, so moving along to catfish, just lump these all together for the regulations here. The channel catfish is... Uh, 10 fish, no minimum length limit. The flathead catfish is 5 fish with no minimum length limit. And the blue catfish is 10 fish with the protected slot where you cannot keep fish between 26 and 34 inches. And only 2 fish can be over 34 inches over the slot. So uh, we sample, there's two ways we typically sample catfish, you can use low frequency electrofishing, and what we'll do is we'll have two boats, one will be electrofishing, and one will be the chase boat, and they turn the electricity on, and especially if you're in the right place, in the right time, in the right settings, the little blue cats, especially on Truman, start coming up all over, you get flat heads up too, so that's one of the ways that we sample catfish on Truman, is with the electrofishing. And the other thing we'll use is jug lines. That's what we used in the pre-evaluation of the slot limit. We use jug lines and that kind of mimics what most of the anglers or a lot of the anglers out there are using. We're kind of catch the same fish that they're catching. So here is a picture of, from a drone footage looking down on two boats while we were electrofishing. And I know you guys probably won't be able to pick it up, but I'm gonna stick some red arrows on here and you can see where I think there's fish. And you, I don't know how well you can see them, but there's probably 30 or 40 fish around those two boats. The guy that was growing, flying the drone got it up to 200 feet, which is high enough you start having a hard time seeing those fish. And he said that he couldn't, he still couldn't see all the fish in his, his camera view at 200 feet up in the air. Which kind of gives you an idea of how many small blue catfish there are out there. And this is up in the upper end of the lake, probably out around Sparrowfoot, if I remember correctly. A lot of those fish, 8 to 10 inches, and we, almost, we have too many of those fish in the lake. And that's part of the reason for the slot. We've got a lot of small fish. They don't grow very well. And then once they get up around 20 inches, a lot of people like to keep those fish and eat those fish. Those are your good eaters, so they get harvested really fast, and they start disappearing really fast. And that's why we put the slot in the place. So a little bit about aging catfish. So you can take a pectoral spine, we can pull that off the fish without killing it, and then we clean it up. You can take a section of it, that's a section of the pectoral spine there in the third picture on the top right, to the right, and then you can put that pectoral spine under the microscope and you can see rings. You count them rings up and you know how old the fish are. You can also use what we call an otolith. It's a bone that's in their head. It's a little bit more reliable, but you have to kill the fish to get it out of it. And 
I have some examples of that on my table back there if you want to come back and visit the booth. But they're really small. They're little bones that are in their head, about the size of the, the end of an ink pen. And we mount those on a microscope slide and then put them under a microscope and we'll age fish using that. So... So we have a flathead catfish project that's going on right now. I think we're in the second year of it. And it's a bigger project. It includes some other lakes. It has Smithville, Stockton, Table Rock, and five small impoundments. It's part of a bigger project that includes Truman. And we're looking at the population dynamics of our reservoirs, the flatheads in the reservoirs around the state. And flatheads are a fish that's hard for us to sample, even with the gears that we can use. So part of this project is trying to help key in on one of some of the best ways to monitor those populations and sample those fish. And then generally looking at the side structure and what population model modeling we can do to evaluate the regulations and make sure everything's good there. The largest flathead catfish that they've caught in the project on Truman Lake was 51 and a quarter inches long and it weighed 66.4 pounds and they caught that fish in June of 2021. So there may not be a lot of them out there but there are some some flatheads over 60 pound in Truman. So the blue catfish, I know anyone that knows blue catfish is aware of the slot limit and there's been a lot of I know there's some few people in the crowd here that don't like the slot limit, and I know there's a few that do like the slot limit. We are in the process of getting ready to evaluate the slot regulation. As long as everything we, we have planned in the budget, and as long as everything goes through, we're going to be out there in the fall of 2022, and we're going to jug line, we're going to use the methods we did 10 years ago before the slot limit was in place. We're going to be sampling the fish to see how many are out there. We're going to be looking at aging some fish to see what that age structure was or is. And we're going to we're going to be doing some angler surveys. I'm not sure exactly what those angler surveys are going to look like, but I know they're going to be incorporated into the study. And try to look at the slot and see whether it's doing what we want to do see whether people are happy with that slot regulation or whether we need to change something up and go to something a little bit different. So I have been aging some catfish on Truman and this is all of them thrown on the graph as you can see. I start this at eight inches or eight years old and ten inches because it's hard to get everything on the graph. But a lot of those fish, and I get a lot of questions, you know, how old is a 25-inch fish right before it goes in the slot? How long does it take to go in the slot? And those fish have aged anywhere from 9 or 10 to as much as... I had a fish earlier this year that aged like 22, 23 years old. It was 20-some inches, low 20 inches long, like 21 or 22. I'm not sure exactly what it was. So most of those fish, though, on average, are probably taking about... 13 years to get into the slot limit, maybe a little more, 13 to 15 years. And then a lot of those fish, by the time they get out of the slot, to get a fish over 35 inches, it's going to take at least 20 years. So these are really slow growing fish, especially in this fishery, and it just takes a long time to get those fish grown and, and through that whole life cycle. So, you know, I, I talk about things like crappie. And, you know, our oldest, very oldest crappie in the fishery may be 12 years old. But the majority of the fish, and even the good fish, the 14, 15 inchers, a lot of those fish are 6 or 7 years old. So, you know, I'm 4 years into my career, and the, the heart of the fishery, those 10 to 12 inch fish that people really like to catch, those are fish that were, that were born when I was on the job. And then I turn around and I got catfish that a lot of these fish are over 20 years old. I have a fish here who was harvested by an angler this past fall, and I got the oldest off of it and aged it and started counting up the rings. This fish was 31 years old. So, like, this fish was born when I was three years old. <laughs> and if a fish does that again now, he's going to outlive my entire career with the department. So it's a totally different perspective, you know, going from crappie fishery that turns over every four or five years most of the fish in that fishery to 
if if you want to catch a 35 or 40 inch fish catfish out of Truman, it's going to take 20 years. So it's 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 a lot different. You have to look at things different. You have to manage it different, and it just takes time for a regulation to change things. It takes time for things to happen in the, in the catfish fishery. So. And that is that is the fish that was 31 years old. It was 32 pounds and 39 inches long. So, with that, I've got a lot of help along the way from a lot of anglers, a lot of guys that are helping me with fish. They're getting fish for me so that I can age them. I have guys that have helped with the brush piles and, and different ways along the line. So I'd like to thank... I'm, not going to read them all out, but thank all the people that have helped me one way or another get fish or help me with my job and help me with what I'm doing because without your guys, it's not, not just the fish, but from the input from the anglers is what helps me understand where I need to go and what direction I need to do to do my job the best I can. So thank all of you for your input and, and everything you do for me. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions if anyone has any questions. Thank you all.